yet nothing is compared to the wonders seen in the skies this night. Eyewitnesses from every continent report strange lights descending from the skies. Video footage and sightings of religious symbols and even apparitions continues to mount. Reported visitations are occurring in towns and villages around the globe. who predicted such events would occur are stepping forward to offer answers. They say we should welcome these visitors as benevolent and that they are here to help us move into a new era of peace and global unity. As bizarre as this may sound, the government so far up to this point offered no other explanation. Stay tuned for an interview with the man who says angels of light have been visiting him since 1995. These alleged angels predicted this new age was soon approaching. Paranormal and the supernatural realm. How should the average person react to claims of apparitions visiting Earth? They're unexplainable, yet millions of believers lend credence to the possibility that something is happening. Recent appearances of Mary have been reported in nearly every habitable nation. Are these events legitimate? Is God sending us a message? However you answer, one thing is certain. The apparitions of the Blessed Virgin Mary draw millions to every corner of the globe. Around the world, reports of supernatural events are drawing millions to apparition sites where the Virgin Mary is said to be appearing. Thousands of visionaries from every conceivable background describe a beautiful young woman glowing in radiant splendor. Her hair is going up. Yeah, she's beautiful. She's real big. Yeah, she's big. She's just standing there. It just paralyzed us. It was so impressive. She emanated an incredible light. It was as if I had entered into another world. There was such silence. She appears as a living, breathing, three-dimensional lady, enveloped in exquisite light. Sears, when describing her, admit that the Queen of Heaven transcends human description. Millions flock to apparition sites, hoping to encounter the Blessed Virgin Mary. 
consider that 15 to 20 million Marian followers visit a single shrine in Guadalupe, Mexico every single year. The shrine is dedicated to Our Lady of Guadalupe, who appeared in 1531 to seer Juan Diego. Many of the pilgrims claim miracles are still occurring in Guadalupe today, the result of Mary's continued presence. In war-torn Bosnia, an estimated 30 million pilgrims have visited Majugori since the apparitions of the Blessed Virgin Mary began in 1981. Besides the six visionaries who regularly receive messages from the Virgin, thousands of pilgrims claim to see signs and wonders, experience healing, and hear the voice of Mary at Majugori. In Conyers, Georgia, seer Nancy Fowler has received up to 100,000 visitors to her farm on a single day. The pilgrims come from all over, many traveling great distances to hear the Virgin's most recent message. Do I ask of you? Lo que estoy pidiéndoles a ustedes is to trust me. Es que confíen en mí. Tell my children. Dear mis hijos. I am alive. Many followers believe the Blessed Mother is present. Currently, she is appearing all over the world, hundreds of times. There, there are many visionaries. Nancy is one of the links. And uh, the time is running out, and Our Lady said that she is stopping in everywhere. Definitely believe something's going on. And for all those who believe, they may now have the proof they need to convince others. Two scientists from Columbia came to the farm yesterday to study Fowler, and they say she is definitely seeing something when she goes into her trances. It has a brain activity that looks and seems to be like coma, but she is awake and fully responsive. Conyers, Georgia is not unique. Apparitions from almost every state in America are being reported. From New York to California, visitations from a supernatural lady identifying herself as Mary, the mother of Jesus, have been documented. Nor is this phenomenon unique to America. She is appearing everywhere. In 1997, Newsweek ran a cover story on Mary's growing popularity. The article states, In many ways, the 20th century has belonged to Mary. From almost every continent, visionaries have reported more than 400 apparitions of the Virgin, more than in the previous three centuries combined. Taken together, these visions point to what the Marian movement believes is a millennial age of Mary. In Lourdes, France, the site of the apparition of Mary that proclaimed herself the Immaculate Conception, five and one-half million pilgrims descend upon the Virgin's shrine annually. Pilgrims come to adore Mary and drink from the miraculous spring. Many reported healings have been documented. The devotion to the Blessed Mother at Lourdes and around the world is remarkable. Poland's Marian shrine our Lady of Jasna Gora draws an estimated five million pilgrims a year. Known as the Black Madonna of Poland, she is considered the Queen of Poland by Pope John Paul and the faithful. Kazimierz the Great, he, he declared Our Lady Queen of Poland. Very unusual. Father Simon Stefanowicz explains Mary's importance to the people of Poland and her abiding presence at Jasna Gora. 
Devotion is very strong and very widespread. Constant revelation and constant apparition of Mary through this answering the prayers and the trust to God through Mary, this I could say. Certainly the Marian movement has international scope. In Knock, Ireland, a single apparition site has drawn millions who come to pray and visit the apparition gable. This Marian shrine has been honored by four popes this century, including Pope John Paul II, who went on pilgrimage to Knock in 1979, and Mother Teresa, who visited the apparition site in 1993. Researchers and experts acknowledge that apparitions are occurring worldwide. Over the past several years, as I've traveled to many different countries around the world, I've made some observations that apparitions of Mary are appearing or have appeared almost everywhere. One of the observations that I've made is that when apparitions are being made, there are supernatural phenomena that are associated with them, including healings, signs and wonders, and as people call them, miracles. And there's no question whatsoever in my mind that these things are credible, that they are happening. I think without doubt, millions of people are claiming that they are seeing visions of Mary. I think it's interesting that in the last 150 years, as the devotion to Mary has increased through the proclamation of the Immaculate Conception and the Assumption of Mary, and more prayer is being directed to Mary, I'm not surprised that these apparitions are appearing. The following of Mary today is becoming worldwide. I, I believe that it is going not only to become greater in America, uh, but uh, already in South America and Central America, because that's where I've been so many times, it, it's huge. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you don't believe in, in Mary, you know, you're like a cast off. The apparitions of uh, uh, Virgin Mary are supernatural. There's no doubt, uh, beginning in Medjugorje, it's spreading all around the Croatia. And uh, people are devoted to Mary because it is a supernatural power. Unlike other alleged paranormal activities, evidence indicates that the apparitions of the Virgin Mary are of a supernatural origin and that her motives are pure. Her frequent messages to pray, turn to God, and work toward peace indicate a benevolent agenda. Also, the good fruits attributed to her appearances cannot be overstated. Many individuals claim that they have drawn closer to God since their encounter with the Virgin. Others testify to the many signs and wonders as evidence that God has sent Mary in these last days. It's just so much bigger than it actually is just because of the the miracles that take place here. I mean, there's crutches in the corner and people have been healed here. As you can see, like, from uh, like the, the hands and like up here, and it, it soaked the inside. This was like uh, full of oil. They have like cups and stuff. Now, it's exuding oil by itself? Yeah, it's, uh, this is uh, something that's common in Egypt. This happens a lot and they're used to this. It's really not unusual. It's just unusual that it happened here in America. The chance for, for people to see that there is a miracle here and try to get them to, to, to believe in, in something that might, a lot of people might not believe in just hearing about it. They say God works in mysterious ways. I saw the Virgin. She came out of the clouds, you know, and I saw her. I saw the, uh, the seal of water. I saw the Virgin Mary wearing a crown of gold. <laughs> Mary had turned her silver into gold. This was all sterling silver. The beads and the crucifix, everything is gold. I touched my rosary to the cross hanging outside the home, and it actually turned from silver to gold. And the silent young man himself produces one picture after another of the Mother Mary, along with statuettes, all with liquid coming from the eyes. What do you believe is on that cotton wool? Mary's tears. Tears of Mary. Is it, I mean, physically, what do you believe it is? The tears of Mary. The tears of Mary. You don't think it's scented oil? No. no. It's impossible. This oil is flowing. It cannot be scented oil. 
Look at it. It's just flowing. As you it's coming from nowhere, from the ice. Go, go take a picture behind you. You called it oil. Right. Yeah, it's oil. It's, it's oil, and the meaning of that is anointing the sick. In addition to supernatural signs, numerous bona fide healings have been recorded. David Parks was healed of terminal cancer while on pilgrimage to Majugori. Well, I went out to Medjugorje uh, spiritually bankrupt. I went out uh, with just a few weeks to live. I had a serious illness for 12 years and had 10 major surgeries. And after the last surgery, I was told I had weeks to live. I went out and uh, that's where I found our Blessed Mother. That's where I found uh, she came. I received a great physical healing, but most important of all, a spiritual healing. And my whole life has been transformed because of the messages of Our Lady, because she all he asks to do is pray, pray, and pray. All signs point to monumental activity in the supernatural realm. Does the Bible anticipate these end time events? What role will the apparitions of Mary play in the days ahead? I believe Mary will usher in global peace and unity. She is the key. She has said that her immaculate heart will triumph, and it will, and I believe it's very soon. But she did say that in the end, her immaculate heart will triumph and there will be a time of peace. And um, so it's definitely, um, if we follow Our Lady's request, that's praying the rosary every day, for the world to be consecrated to her Immaculate Heart and for us to do the, the, the devotions of the first five Saturdays, then Our Lady said that in the end her Immaculate Heart will triumph and there will be peace and a time of, of, of goodness and peace in the world. Mother Mary's apparitions are appearing more, much more frequently today than they did in the past. Uh, because uh, from what we see through this theological lens, it's approaching the eschatological times, the end times, uh, very nearly now. The evil is so intense that in history, whenever it seems like it reached an impossible place for us, then God steps in. And He steps in with Mary as the commander-in-chief of all the, the forces that she's grown to love. Do you see how these people love her in this Marian conference? These events are truly remarkable. Millions of devout believers all over the world follow and obey the apparitions of Mary. However, the Bible tells us to test all spirits, even those that come in the name of Christ. As Christians, we believe the Bible is God's inspired message to mankind. Let's divert for a moment and examine some of the evidence which demonstrates that the Bible is truly God's Word and our only source of discerning spiritual truth. I believe that the Bible is God's inspired word because of the fulfillment of prophecies. In the Old Testament, there are more than 300 predictions concerning the Messiah and his first coming that Jesus fulfilled when he came to earth. Well, there are many prophecies that we could look at. The Bible says that he would be born of a virgin. We know that that took place. The Bible says that he would be born in Bethlehem of Judah. That took place. Daniel chapter 9 says that he, the Messiah, would have to be born before the destruction of the temple and the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD by Titus and the Roman army. And so Jesus fulfilling those prophecies. Psalm 22 graphically portrays the cruel death, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. In fact, Psalm 22, which graphically details the crucifixion, was written 1,000 years before crucifixion was a method of punishment by the Romans. The Old Testament is replete with prophecies anticipating the Messiah. For instance, Isaiah 61 prophesied that Messiah would preach good tidings to the poor and liberty to the captives. 
while Deuteronomy 18:18 18, 18 declared that Messiah would be a prophet. Zechariah wrote of Messiah these words, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey. And the prophet Isaiah wrote this concerning Messiah. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. In addition, the Holy Spirit predicted the crucifixion 1,000 years before it was invented. They pierced my hands and my feet. As well, God spoke through Zechariah, and I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. What are the chance factors that Jesus could have fulfilled these 300 predictions? One of the predictions is that Bethlehem would be his birthplace. Now, what chances are there for a individual to be born in Bethlehem? Well, you take the average population of the earth from the time of Micah's prophecy, and you compare it with the average prop, uh, population of Bethlehem, and you find that only one in 280,000 people were born in Bethlehem. The minute you say Bethlehem would be his birthplace, you've eliminated the vast majority of people from claiming to be the Messiah. It declared that he would be betrayed by a friend for 30 pieces of silver. It said the silver would then be thrown down in the temple in the house of the Lord, and it would be used to buy a potter's field. Jesus fulfilled over 300 Old Testament prophecies. Uh, I, I have a a mere bachelor's degree in math. I know a little bit about probability, and uh, it couldn't happen by chance. Furthermore, there are things that you just couldn't manipulate uh, either. Uh, for example, it was prophesied he would be born in Bethlehem. How do you get yourself born in Bethlehem? Uh, it was prophesied that he would rise from the dead. How do you rise from the dead? if you're not really God. It was prophesied, Daniel 9, the very day that he would ride into Jerusalem on that donkey. Now, how could you possibly, you've got to be born at the right time in history. And how can you manipulate a crowd, a crowd of people that lined the road down from the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem and hailed him as the Messiah? How are you going to do that? Every detail of his betrayal, the price of the transaction, where it took place, who finally ends up with the money, uh, and on and on it goes, er, uh, incredible details, all laid out in advance. And no one can dispute that because the Old Testament was translated into Greek three centuries before Christ was born, the so-called Septuagint version. We have four copies of those. Amazingly, Jesus fulfilled all the Messianic prophecies exactly, though they were written hundreds of years before his birth. The probability of fulfilling just eight of these prophecies has been calculated to be one chance in 10 to the 28th power. Certainly, Jesus is the Messiah, God the Son, the Savior of the world. When Luke wrote to his friend Theophilus, the book known as the Acts of the Apostles, he said that Jesus showed himself alive after his passion or death by many infallible proofs. With Jesus, there were many eyewitnesses of his resurrection. In fact, Paul tells us that there was over 500 at one time. The capstone of Christianity is the resurrection of Christ. The evidence that Jesus rose from the dead is overwhelming. First, the New Testament reports that hundreds of eyewitnesses saw Jesus after he rose. Yeah, if I told you that um, John F. Kennedy was killed in Dealey Plaza by a bow and arrow, 
Could I ever sell you that story? No, of course not. Why? Because among us are eyewitnesses to that event. And when Paul wrote his first letter to the Corinthians, among his audience were hundreds of people, because over 500 people witnessed the Lord's return. So he didn't have the burden of, of, uh, of trying to create that out of thin air. The people that he was writing to were aware of it. Second, the Roman and Jewish authorities were never able to produce Christ's body, though they sealed and guarded the tomb. There are two major responses to the resurrection. The first is Rome, which is, when you read in the Gospels, is quite muted. Uh, bearing in mind that uh, there were strong military power in Palestine at the time, and they could have um, had the, the disciples stolen the body, they could have got the might of Rome to produce that body, but they didn't, which suggests to me that the resurrection was genuine. If the resurrection of Jesus Christ didn't occur, it would have been very easy to disprove. Point to the body. The body of Jesus Christ was not found. Third, the apostles, who were cowards during Jesus' trials and crucifixion, became bold witnesses of his resurrection after they met the risen Lord, even to their dying breath. With regard to the disciples, um, their initial response is one of fear, uh, intimidation of the Jews, but after the resurrection, there's a great boldness. Um, so again, that suggests to me that something happened that changed their lives, that they were willing even to die as a result of the gospel they preached regarding the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Suddenly you find in a few weeks' time that these men are going forth into all the world to proclaim a risen Christ. It is quite evident that the change of heart that they experienced was because they had truly seen the risen Christ. There is no other logical explanation for it. And these men, all but one of them, lost their lives proclaiming Christ, Him crucified and Him risen from the dead. Only one of them reached a ripe old age and that was John. So it is quite clear that the evidence of history in the lives of these men confirms the resurrected Christ. Furthermore, Jesus' death and resurrection changed the course of history and rewrote time from B.C., meaning before Christ, to A.D., or Anno Domini, meaning the year of our Lord. Anyone rejecting Christ's resurrection or the Bible as the inspired Word of God is rejecting a fact proven more absolutely than any other fact in the world. Someone is said that the Bible is like an anvil, that the hammers of men have been pounding against it for centuries. The hammers have long worn out, but the anvil still stands. And so the Bible, God's Word, people have attacked it for years, it still stands, and the attackers have long fallen. Truly, the Bible is God's Word to mankind. 2 Timothy 3.16 states that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and for instruction. In John chapter 1, we are told that Jesus Himself is the Word of God. And Psalm 138 declares that God has even magnified His Word above His name. It is with the Word of God that we will test these messages from heaven. Those familiar with the Word of God know that apparitions occurred during biblical times. Trances and uh, apparitions are biblical. If we look in the Bible, we see examples, say for example in Acts 10, where Peter is fasting and, and in prayer, and he falls into a trance, and in this trance an angel appears to him, and as a result of that he brings the gospel to the Gentiles via Cornelius. And today, there is significant evidence that apparitions are manifesting. For example, the video, Marian Apparitions of the 20th Century, documents visionaries during actual encounters with an apparition.
However, the Bible records that not all apparitions originate from God. The only way to test experiences that are biblically related is to test them biblically. Because if we embrace experiences that are extra biblical, there is no question we're going to be deceived. It is no surprise to followers that the apparition of Mary repeatedly proclaims biblical themes. Here is an example from Our Lady of Magigori. Dear children, today I am calling you to pray with the heart. Throughout this season of grace, I wish each of you to be united to Jesus. But without unceasing prayer, you will not be able to experience the beauty and greatness of the grace which God is offering you. Larry Lewis is one of a growing number of individuals who converted because he believes the apparitions are biblical. I was a Protestant minister for over 30 years in different areas of, uh, of ministry, and um, I was very content, happy, uh, thrilled about it actually. And uh, then, uh, pastoring the United Methodist Church, uh, in the middle of that, of my pastorate uh, there, we were kind of blindsided by the Blessed Mother. She kind of came out of nowhere and uh, really began to turn our whole lives around. And you take Magigoria, for example, everything that Mary says is right out of the scriptures. So what she's doing is affirming that which we know to be true and encouraging us in the process as we look forward, in a sense, to our coming passion or the time, at least in our life, when uh, things might be tough and so forth. Turn back our eyes to Jesus and follow him. Archimandrite Stephen Barham, a popular speaker at Marian conferences, attended Assemblies of God before becoming a priest. We look for certain signs. Number one, the positive sign, conversions, lives change. And I think that Medjugorje, when, when some of the bishops asked the Holy Father when they made their limited visit about Medjugorje, pulled his chair back and said, conversions, conversions everywhere, Medjugorje conversions, and that's good. So he said, I pray for a good end to Medjugorje. And then we look at the content. The content is the same basic structure as the gospel. Repent, be converted, fast, pray, pray for the renewal of the church, go back to the sacraments. All of those things authenticate that we're dealing with something real. For these reasons and others, the Roman Catholic Church has approved several apparitions. In addition, Pope John Paul has been called the Marian Pope. He credits Our Lady of Fatima with saving his life, and he has twice consecrated the entire world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, done in response to the apparition's request made at Fatima. Furthermore, the Pope wrote these startling words in his book, Crossing the Threshold of Hope. After my election as Pope, as I became more involved in the problems of the Universal Church, I came to have a similar conviction. On this universal level, if victory comes, it will be brought by Mary. Christ will conquer through her, because he wants the Church's victories now and in the future to be linked to her. The Pope's Marian devotion is truly exceptional. Well, I would, of course, call Pope John Paul II the Marian Pope because he has gone to all the Marian shrines in the world. In his first few years, in fact, he picked them out and he came to Ireland here. And when he came to Knock, he said he had reached the goal of his pilgrimage in Ireland when he came to this Marian shrine. I would call Pope John Paul without any question that he's the, uh, uh, the Marian Pope. Uh, this, he's widely known throughout the whole world as Mary's, Mary's Pope. Even more important than the Pope's convictions, the numerous miracles, or the apparent good fruit, is the fact that the apparition has at times encouraged the reading of God's Word. Dear children, today I ask you to read the Bible in your homes every day. Put it in a visible place where it will always remind you to read it and pray it.
The apparition's messages have many scriptural truths. Certainly messages to pray, read the Bible, and trust in Jesus are biblical. Is it possible that God has sent the Blessed Virgin Mary to wake us out of our spiritual slumber? There's other marks around the building, but it doesn't form a pattern like she is. I think it's for real. It's a miracle. This is the Blessed Mother's way of screaming at people. Despite the evidence that the apparitions are benevolent, a number of Christians are concerned that this phenomenon may be a grand deception. The scriptures warn us very clearly that Satan is a master deceiver and that Satan actually can appear as an angel of light. And we know that the Word of God is light. So Satan can actually manifest himself in the form of the truth or appear to be true and yet be deceptive. Satan, we're told, is like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Or as Paul writes, he is the one who schemes or plans to deceive the whole world. He's the God of this world who blinds the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the glorious gospel. He has a master plan to deceive. I believe that we must test every experience by the Word of God. I think that is clear in the case of Peter who had a marvelous experience, the transfiguration of Christ. And yet, in his own epistle, he wrote, we have a more sure word of prophecy, and he was referring to the Word of God. That is the standard by which we must judge all things, not our own personal experience, because experiences are most unreliable. To critically test these manifestations, we will examine those messages that have received full church approval or those messages which carry the imprimatur of the local Catholic bishop. And Medjugorje, though not formally approved, it has been openly affirmed by numerous bishops, cardinals, and the Pope himself. The following represent common messages from the apparition of Mary. Dear children, today I invite you to ask yourself why I am with you this long. I am the mediatrix between you and God. Do not let yourselves be seized by fear or discouragement. Have great confidence in the powerful work of intercession and mediation of your Heavenly Mother. Many apparitions give the message that Mary is the mediator or intercessor for mankind. That is contrary to the scriptures. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, verse 25, the Bible says that Jesus Christ ever lives to make intercession for the saints. And in the book of 1 Timothy and in the book of Hebrews, the Bible declares that there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. For someone to be the mediator between God and man, he had to be fully God, he had to be fully man, he had to be sinless, and Jesus Christ, indeed, is fully God and fully man. Little children, I am the mother of good counsel, mediator, who is trying to persuade you to listen to the call. My message is of faith, love, and hope. More than anything, it brings reconciliation between people and nations. It is the only thing that can save this century from war and eternal death. Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life, and he is the bridge builder between God and men. And if you try to go to the right or the left, you'll never get there. It's only through Jesus Christ, period. The Bible states clearly, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Not only does the apparition claim to be our mediator and intercessor, but she also claims to be our advocate with God. The world is degenerating, so much so that it was necessary for the Father and the Son to send me into the world, among all the peoples, in order to be their advocate and to save them. 
We are told in 1 John 2 that if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Christ alone was righteous, and therefore he, on the basis of his righteousness, is able to intercede to advocate for sinners. And so these roles belong exclusively to Christ and cannot in any shape or form be ascribed to Mary. Jesus Christ is our advocate. He never suggested that anybody come to him through Mary. Never on this earth and not now. Never ever is this stated. And furthermore, it denigrates Jesus Christ. Why can't I go right to him? He's my savior. He's the one who loves me. And he said that we would go to the Father through him. Then where does Mary come in? Not in the Bible. In addition to these claims, the apparition actually says, she is here to save the world. I call upon you to open yourselves completely to me, so that through each of you, I may be enabled to convert and save the world. I alone am able still to save you from the calamities which approach. Those who place their confidence in me will be saved. My daughter, in this time, I am the Ark for all your brethren. I am the Ark of Peace. I am the Ark of Salvation, the Ark where my children must enter if they wish to live in the Kingdom of God. I think it's most important in Matthew chapter 1 when the angel appears to Joseph to announce the impending birth. He says, first of all, about Mary, she shall bear a son. That is to be her role, to bear a son. And then he says to Joseph, and this is what he had to do, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So Mary was to bear the son, Joseph was to name him, but Christ is the Savior. He will save people from their sins. And of course, Peter confirms in his first epistle that we were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without spot and without blemish. There is only one Savior of man. Christ said himself, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. You know, Mary acknowledges that she's a sinner and she needs a Savior. And here we see by the scripture that she actually is pleading for Jesus to become her own Savior. In Luke chapter 1, verse 46, it says, Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. What a beautiful statement for Mary. Simple, humble Mary. The Apostle Peter proclaimed that Jesus has become the chief cornerstone, nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And throughout the Bible, God proclaims, You shall know no God but me, for there is no Savior besides me. Furthermore, the apparition ascribes to herself many additional characteristics that only God possesses. For example, she claims to be ever-present. You will never be alone. My immaculate heart will be your refuge and the way which will lead you to God. At every moment, you must be just as I would have you be. At every moment, you must do just what I would have you to do. Do not be afraid. I will always be near you. Do not be grieved. I am with all of you, even though you do not see me. I am mother of all of you sinners. An amazing thing about the apparitions, she is claiming to be at the same place at the same time all over the world. That is claiming to have attributes of deity. Only God has the attribute of omniscience, omnipresence, and omnipotence. They are ascribing God-like qualities to Mary, who was a humble handmaid of the Lord, obedient to the Lord. She is a wonderful example to believers, but she is certainly not the omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent Mary of Roman Catholicism. 
Of course, Jesus, who is God Almighty, promised his followers, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The apparition has even proclaimed herself co-redemptrix. I stand here as the co-redemptrix and advocate. Everything should be concentrated on that. Repeat this after me. The new dogma will be the dogma of the co-redemptrix. Until I am acknowledged there where the Most Holy Trinity has willed me to be, I will not be able to exercise my power fully in the maternal work of co-redemption and of the universal mediation of graces. The whole idea that Mary is to be a co-redemptrix of, of Jesus Christ, of course, is contrary to biblical understanding. It's one thing to be a little heterodox. It's one thing to be at the periphery. It's quite another to go in direct opposition to the central truth of the Bible. We're not talking about details. Many denominations have exaggerations or views about some of the what we'll call peripheral issues. We're talking here about going head to head to the central theme of the gospel. And when I say gospel, I mean that theme that God has laid out from Genesis chapter 3 to the end. And uh, that's why these, th these assertions, these claims are, are anti-biblical, not just non-biblical, anti-biblical and uh, are dangerous. We read in Revelation concerning Jesus, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. And throughout the Bible, God reiterates that he alone is the Redeemer. As for our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts is his name, the Holy One of Israel. In addition to these anti-biblical assertions, the apparition of Mary claims to suffer and even atone for sins. I love you even when you are far away from me and my son. I ask you not to allow my heart to shed tears of blood because of the souls who are being lost through sin. For a long time I have suffered for you. If I do not want my son to abandon you, I am forced to pray to him myself without ceasing. You pay no heed. However much you would do, you could never recompense the pain I have taken for you. I boldly assert that his suffering became my suffering because his heart was mine. And just as Adam and Eve sold the world for an apple, so in a certain sense, my son and I redeemed the world with one heart. Uh, in many of the apparitions that people get in the day of Mary, she claims to suffer and uh, atone with Jesus. Uh, that is not biblical because the Bible declares that Christ uh, has suffered for our sins. In fact, when he died, he said, it is finished. He has paid our sins and our suffering completely on the cross. Peter writes, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. And the book of Hebrews states that Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. There is no longer an offering for sin. I've often heard Roman Catholic people and prelates teaching that Mary was suffering for sin. But by saying that, they fail to understand what it means to suffer for sin. To suffer for sin is to suffer vicariously as a substitute. And it means to take punishment inflicted upon you by God. And the Word of God makes it plain, for instance, in Isaiah 53, 
that he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was laid upon him. This is referring prophetically to Christ. The last verse of Romans 4 says that he, Christ, was delivered for our offenses. Peter says that he, that is Christ, bore our sins in his own body upon the tree. And the suffering for sin had to involve death because the wages of sin is death. So therefore Mary in no sense suffered for us. This comparison could go on and on as the apparition ascribes to Mary nearly every attribute found only in Christ. For instance, the Bible says that all have sinned except Jesus, yet the apparition claims to be sinless. While Jesus is the new Adam, the apparition claims to be the new Eve. Jesus ascended bodily, yet the apparition claims that Mary was assumed bodily. Jesus alone destroyed the works of the devil, yet the apparition claims that Mary will crush the serpent. The Bible calls Jesus the morning star, while the apparition refers to Mary as the morning star. Despite the apparition's claims, God is jealous for his glory. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. We have examined only church-approved messages and those from Magigory, yet even these clearly contradict the Bible. Certainly the humble maid servant of the Lord would never draw attention to herself, nor would the Blessed Virgin Mary ever contradict the Word of God. If this is not the Mary of Nazareth, then how do we explain these events? Who or what is behind these manifestations? has the Blessed Mother in it, if you can see. That is the Blessed Mother. We did see the miracle of the sun. We saw the sun spinning. Uh, so we were very uh, thrilled. I saw the cross, okay, right okay in the sun, and then I saw the host right in the middle of the sun, and then I saw another circle. Some of the apparition's messages are shamelessly unbiblical. I am she who is related to the divine trinity. I am the virgin of revelation. Yet God declares, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. My children, I am the door of heaven and the help on earth. In the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord referred to the broad road which would lead to destruction, and many there be that find that road. But then he talked about the narrow road, namely himself, and few there would be who would find him. So it is the narrow road. There is only one path to God. Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. There is only one way to heaven, and that is through Christ and him crucified. There are many other problems. For instance, the apparition even commands her followers to venerate her statues. As mother, I want to tell you that I am here with you, represented by the statue you have here. Each of my statues is a sign of a presence of mine and reminds you of your heavenly mother. Therefore, it must be honored and put in places of greater veneration. You should look with love at every image of your heavenly mother. Contrast this with the Lord's command given in Deuteronomy. Take careful heed to yourselves, for you saw no form when the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire, lest you act corruptly and make for yourselves a carved image in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female. The apparition has also requested shrines be erected in her honor around the globe. I ardently desire a temple built for me here, where I can show and offer all my love, compassion, help, and protection, for I am your merciful mother. Mm -hmm. 
Most of the apparitions ask for a shrine to be built, and shrines are built there are thousands all over the world. And people come and kneel before Mary. They, I've seen them walking on their knees, bloody knees, at Fatima and so forth. Uh, and they're doing this out of penance and trying to curry Mary's favor. You don't have to do that. Furthermore, we don't need Mary's favor. Uh, we need Christ's redemption, his grace and mercy, and it comes to us by grace. It's not of works, otherwise it wouldn't be grace. So you can't earn it. And never, ever did anyone in the Bible bow down before Mary, even when Mary was there with, at the birth of Jesus. It says they worshiped him. They didn't bow down to Mary or to, or to Joseph. When these apparitions are pointing to Mary and asking the people to uh, give her great reverence and to honor her with shrines or with these other things, uh, it uh, flies in the face of the scripture of which Jesus said the Holy Spirit will lead us to the worship of Jesus and him alone. It is very apparent to me that the Mary of the Bible is not the Mary of the apparitions that are taking place in the world today. Because the apparition Mary draws attention to herself and the Mary of the Bible clearly pointed people to Jesus Christ, her son. If the apparitions are not Mary, who then is appearing? Ironically, the apparition gives us the answer. I am Mary, the Queen of Heaven and the Queen of Angels. Mary is definitely the Queen of Heaven. She's a mother of God. She's our mother. There's no other woman in this whole world that ever could compare to the Blessed Mother. The apparitions often come in the name or the term the Queen of Heaven. And this is interesting to me in light of the scriptures. Because in the Old Testament, Jeremiah talked about very clearly the Queen of Heaven as an abomination before God. Repeatedly in the book of Jeremiah, God himself identifies the Queen of Heaven as a pagan goddess and rebukes his people for following her. My people Israel make cakes for the Queen of Heaven, and they pour out drink offerings to other gods, that they may provoke me to anger. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, my anger and my fury will be poured out on this place. When I hear the title Queen of Heaven, it reminds me of a prophecy from the book of Jeremiah, when the Jehovah God rebukes people, when they offered sacrifices to the Queen of Heaven and it was against his will and he was mad because he's a jealous guy, jealous God and uh, his glory he won't give to anyone. The only title to Queen of Heaven in the Bible is a female deity that was condemned by God in the Old Testament in Jeremiah chapter 7 and Jeremiah chapter 44 and I find that title given to the Mary of the Bible as being extremely offensive. Furthermore, the Queen of Heaven often appears with a baby, presumably Jesus. Dear children, here is my son in my arms. I would like to ask you to be a light for all in the year to come. I would like to call you again to live my messages. Sometimes in these apparitions, Mary appears holding a living baby Jesus. Um, again, I would say these are all uh, deceptions of the enemy. Um, because Jesus, as we know, was crucified as a man. He's not going to come back as a baby. In fact, the Bible declares he'll come back as a man to judge this world. So again, that would give evidence if people were seeking for truth that these visions or apparitions are not of God. Peter writes, Jesus Christ has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. 
if Jesus is in his glorified body, reigning from heaven, then the queen of heaven must be presenting a false Christ. The queen of heaven has been around for millennia, seducing and deceiving God's people. Is it possible that she is the entity that is impersonating Mary? Does the Bible indicate that she will be active during earth's final days? Do the scriptures warn us of a wicked woman, lady, and queen who will deceive the nations? In the book of Revelation, we are told of a queen who will influence the world. I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. The waters which you saw, where the harlot sits, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins. For she says in her heart, I sit as queen. In the book of Revelation, which is the last book in the Bible, John reveals to us a portion of his vision in that in the last days there will be a wicked woman who will be part of a delusion that will deceive the whole world. And it's in reference to a woman being a queen. Of course, the apparition often refers to herself as the queen. The Lady of all nations, who is the Bride of the Lord, the Queen of the King, who has now received this title from the Lord. She has once again saved the world by her intercession, once more saved it. Jesus Christ is going to glorify her as the Queen, and she'll be here, and she'll be recognizable as the queen of everything that God has made, the queen of the universe, the queen of all mankind, the queen of everything that God has created. And she'll be the queen, and she'll be a glorified queen. It, it'll, it won't be any question about who she is. And she will be, she'll be the loving mother of Jesus Christ who has all power. In addition, Isaiah chapter 47 predicts the end time demise of the Lady of Kingdoms. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground without a throne. For you shall no longer be called the Lady of Kingdoms. But these two things shall come to you in a moment, in one day, the loss of children and widowhood. They shall come upon you in their fullness because of the multitude of your sorceries. It is disturbing to discover that a major apparition calls herself the Lady of All Nations. At the International Day of Prayer of the Mother and Lady of All Nations, held since 1997 in Amsterdam, thousands gathered to honor and spread the messages of the Lady of All Nations. I, together with my auxiliary bishop, Monsignor Pun, approve the title Lady of All Nations and allowed its public veneration. Mary promised in Fatima that her Immaculate Heart would triumph. This triumph will not be achieved with nuclear arms, however, but through the simple hearts of those who suffer and are persecuted, of those who have dedicated themselves wholly to Mary, the Co-Redemptrix. Under the title, Lady and Mother of All Nations, Mary shows us in Amsterdam the way to peace and unity for the Church and, through the Church, for the world. As startling as these claims are, the apparition's desire to be declared co-redemptrix may soon be met. When the dogma, the last dogma in Marian history, has been proclaimed, the Lady of all nations will give peace true peace to the world. The nations, however, must say my prayer in union with the Church. They must know that the Lady of all nations has come as co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate. So be it. 
I am convinced that through the Lady and Mother of all nations, we will be led into the deepest mystery, the co-redeeming task of Mary. She is truly the co-redemptrix. There is an apparition that is taking place today in Amsterdam that says, I am no longer Mary, I am the Lady of all nations. And it's this apparition that claims that she must be the co-redeemer. And that if she is proclaimed co-redeemer by the Pope, then she will usher in an era of peace. It is also interesting that almost all apparitions stress the importance of peace and unity. For example, the apparition that identifies herself as the mother of the Eucharist has declared, Speak about the mother of the Eucharist, because the mother of the Eucharist closes history. All the messages come from God, and everywhere that I am appearing, I am speaking about the same things. Because through the triumph of the Eucharist, the Mother wants all the churches to be reunited, so that there will be only one church for all the people. Furthermore, on October 8, 2000, Pope John Paul with 1,500 bishops, the largest group to assemble since Vatican II, entrusted humanity and the third millennium to Our Lady of Fatima, an apparition who promises her triumph and global peace. Dear God, you have given us the mother of queen, uh, as queen. Through her intercession, grant us the grace of living eternity with she and her son. So her, her goal and her objective is, uh, is to bring uh, the body of Christ together and through so that we who have been separated, whether it's the Orthodox, whether it's the Protestants, whether it's uh, from the Catholics, you know, whatever group you're talking about, we who have been uh, estranged from one another for all of these years would come together that we might in fact be the body of Christ as a whole unit as Christ prayed in John 17 that we would be. To me, the Marian movement has reached out beyond the Catholic Church. It is apparent that a common front is being presented by these apparitions around the world. No matter where they take place, there's a common message, and that is a global peace, global unity for peace, and no one apparition has ever denied any other apparition. Well, I think the, the world is very, very hungry for peace, and uh, clearly there will be no real peace until the Prince of Peace comes. There will be a false peace. The Bible lays out a great deal of detail of world events the whole geopolitical horizon is laid out in the period of time that we call the end times. The messages of peace are uh, also prophetically relevant, but the Bible tells us when they say peace and safety, then comes sudden destruction. This global peace and unity theme is interesting because the world is also moving towards what is called ecumenicalism. And uh, that all sounds good at first. Gee, we're all going to get along until you realize it involves the denial of truth. The Bible warns of a false peace and unity that will deceive the nations. Furthermore, Jesus and the New Testament writers caution that deception will increase in the last days. For example, Paul writes, but evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. In addition, the Bible warns that the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Throughout the New Testament, we see many different writers, and of course Jesus himself, warning regarding deception in the last days. Jesus said, many will be deceived in my name by many. Paul talked about this deception regarding an apostasy that would take place and many being deceived. 
believing the lie. Peter writes about the deception. Beware of deception that's coming. And believe me, it seems to be happening all around us. In Matthew 24, 24, it says this. This is again Jesus speaking in 24. He says, For false Christ and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders, as notice, as to be deceived, if possible, the very elect. So Jesus here in the 24th chapter, he's speaking to his disciples, he's speaking to us too, and he's sharing that in the last days there's going to be a great deception. There's going to be not only Mary worshipers, but there's going to be also other worshipers that will come in the name of Christ saying they have the right way. Jesus predicts that uh, prior to his return, that false prophets would arise and if possible would even deceive the elect. Um, that suggests to me that uh, these signs and wonders would be so convincing that uh, apart from the grace of God, even genuine Christians can find themselves being deceived and led away. And only by trusting in Jesus and Him totally will we find liberty and freedom from sin. And I would call upon you, if you're, you're, you're out there and you're trusting in your church, you're trusting in your works, none of that will save you. What you need is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that He will set you free and He will give you eternal life today. Whenever a person says that they are trusting in Jesus and, the moment they say and, they've gone too far. Our trust in Jesus alone will bring to us salvation and eternal life. There is a uh, hymn that is sung in the church uh, that talks about I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. The Bible is very clear regarding the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is the message which sets us free. That Jesus Christ loved us so much that he himself came to this earth and died for us as a sacrifice for our sins. We couldn't do it. He did. And because of His sacrifice, and because of who He is and what He's done, and when we recognize who we are and what we've done, and ask Him to forgive us for our sins, the Bible says that we can enter into a relationship with Him, the Creator of the universe, and that relationship will last for eternity. Jesus is the Creator, He is the Redeemer. There is only one Redeemer, and His name is Jesus Christ. You must choose whether to follow Jesus and Him alone or to risk following a deceptive spirit. Jesus loves you and offers eternal life freely for those who will turn to Him by faith. However, the Lord will not force you to follow him. The choice is yours. Our prayer is that you will test these events with the word of God and trust in the Jesus of the Bible. His way is the truth and the only road to everlasting life. My name is Patrick Powell, and may the Lord guide you and bless you with his grace and truth.
give me Jesus. Oh, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have. But give me